you will be getting probably a, a permission to record um, for you. But um, I just to say, well, welcome. This is, what is it? Another one of the Lean Agile London and the second ProCanban.org event. And what we want to do today is a bit of like totally informal, informal open-ended Q&A session about, well, any questions that you have, any questions you would like to talk about, Kanban in general, flow, whatever. I mean, obviously we can start hopefully around those topics. If we start asking about, I don't know, whatever, something really, really different, maybe we're not able to answer. But um, let's make it, as I say, you all have the ability to unmute yourself, to participate on the stuff. If you want to intervene and say that, one good thing to do is if you can please like use the raise hand um, so that helps as well to, to manage the who, who is speaking and all those. Um, but any questions as well, put them on put them on chat. We'll try to be picking them out and talking about them. Okay. So there is no specific format. There is not necessarily there is any prepared slides or anything. It's a ask the Kanban trainer. And we are privileged to have this first session with Julia Wester. Julia. Hello. <laughs> Hi, thanks. Mm. Thanks for having me. So um, Jose is being kind and um, allowing me to help facilitate this session. Um, you know, you can try to stump me, I'm sure, since I'm not, uh, no one's really an expert. We're all on our journeys. I'll let you know if there's something I don't know and maybe we can figure it all out together. But um, yeah, I'd love to hear what questions you have. Um, and, and how you'd like to see this sort of unfold. So as Jose said, um, feel free to raise your hand and mute yourself. And if no one's speaking, we can, you can ask it. Um, but we already have a question coming in to our um, chat window, which is the other place you can write questions and then we'll read them out loud and, and start answering it. So. Since um, we've given enough time for people to actually start asking a question, I'm gonna go in and um, bring up Brianna's question. Uh, Brianna from Texas. Do you encourage ruthless prioritization? I, lo I love this question. I ask this a lot. I always, yeah. I'm always excited to hear answers. Yeah, I, I've never thought it, uh, about it with that terminology, ruthless prioritization, I think maybe yes, though. And I'll explain why, because you have a limited amount of time, you can get almost more, more of almost everything else but time. And so what you choose to do with your time says a lot, and uh, means you're not choosing to do other things. So I think it's very important to really understand why you're trying to do something. And if it doesn't meet the criteria that you really should be spending your time on, then I, I think it's definitely okay to say no if you have the um, ability to do so. So yeah, I mean, I don't know if that's the kind of answer you're looking for, but um, you should have to meet a bar to say yes, not meet a bar to say no, I think. No, I, I agree. Uh, it, it wasn't a trick question, but you gave the answer I was yeah. hoping for. And it, yes. comes down to culture. It, it comes down to then culture. Can you do that? And can you do it successfully? Right? Right. I like to tell people, um, you know, the failure to make decisions about that is a failure to lead, you know, at some level. Because if you're not making that decision, then some other aspect of your context will make it for you. And in that way, you're sort of abdicating that because it's less scary if something else chooses it for you. And when you choose it, you have to take ownership of that choice. But if you recognize that and start to figure out, well, if I wanna take ownership of this choice and I have to understand what goes into making a good choice and start breaking it down, you can start experimenting with the things that go into making good choices look back on what happens based on your choices and continually refine it instead of just avoiding it and abdicating that to chance or circumstance because something will prioritize, whether it's you or time or money or something. So we'd rather be in the driver's seat. We have more control, but it is scary. So you need to be in a relatively safe environment if you're afraid to make a choice because you'll get fired. If you make the wrong one, you'll probably 
abdicate it so you can blame it on chance or, or blame it on circumstances. And I don't blame that at all because I understand why that happens. Yeah, good question. Um, okay, one very common question from Zahid is, <clears throat> When should we use Scrum and when should we use Kanban? I want to know your view on this. Interesting okay. one. <laughs> yeah, so I've, I've done this on, I've had this discussion with people in um, specifically professional Scrum with Kanban classes most recently, because I teach that from scrum.org as well as applying professional Kanban from prokanban.org. And before that, I taught my own homegrown Kanban classes. Um, fortunately, I got to learn from people like Dominica de Grandis, um, who wrote the book Making Work Visible, by the way, awesome book. Um, so I find it very hard to find a situation in which improving the flow of work is a bad thing to do. I find that contextually relevant in very simple transactional rote kind of work, all the way up to improving flow in as much as possible in um, emerging information type of situations. Um, if anyone's familiar with sort of the um, Kenevan complexity model or um, the Stacy, I can't, I'm probably not getting the name right. The Stacy model, what's it called, Jose? The Stacy. Stacy, well, I usually say Stacy model, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so basically they're, they have all the same sort of domains, right? And you're looking at whether work is, um, I'm trying to think of the latest terminology, um, obvious or uh, it used to be simple, but sim obvious work isn't always simple. But the things that you know how to do um, based on just looking at what the request is, and there's always a general way to go about and do that right. Like flow is great for that, but it's also great for putting in um, to practice when you're trying to do emerging work where you aren't sure of um, what needs to be done, but you know the direction and you're gonna iterate there. So I find flow and Kanban, um, Kanban and flow practice is good really across the board. I've challenged people to help me find out times where it's not valuable. Um, the, the difference is when you need to implement um, an approach like Scrum, that's generally not necessary in the, you know, help desk kind of, I've got a script for everything that might pop up kind of situation, but it is more called for in complex work where we can't know everything up front and work and goals are emerging. You might know what to do, but not how to get it done. So that's when um, more empirical type processes are needed. Um, that's probably clear as mud. So Kanban, I see, I, try, I just generally use it. It's like taking your temperature at the doctor's office. I just care about flow all the time. And then I look at what else I wanna layer on top of it. Did that help? Okay. Linz, um, and you have sent me an email that I have been beating myself up for not replying back to you yet. So just so you know, that is on my radar to do. It's in my inbox. Okay, so how would you recommend a team doing Scrum to start or go about Kanban? What would be the first few steps you would consider? Um, I would suggest as a guide to help you on this journey, there's a, there's a professional Scrum with Kanban guide or Kanban for Scrum teams guide that will help you on this journey. It's available at scrum.org. And it basically tries to provide you the minimum flow-based frame to lay on top of your Scrum process. So you don't change anything about Scrum, but you start to think about what flow means and how you can start to measure flow and visualize flow uh, inside your existing Scrum practice. So in, in actuality, what that basically means is you're gonna think about what workflow is, um, and in the guide, you'll see a much more comprehensive definition of workflow. In, other, in how I learned Kanban originally, there was workflow, which was like the activities your work moves through. And then separate were explicit policies and all these other things. Um, more and more, we're seeing 
workflow being a term that's all encompassing. So defining your workflow is not just the activities, but how you do your work and all of that. So there's a big discussion about, um, about thinking about that inside your scrum practice and understanding how your work gets done. And then putting a few basic flow metrics on top of that, and then incorporating additional charts and questions into your existing scrum events, your sprint events. Um, like what are some flow-based things that now you might insert into your retrospectives? How might you insert flow considerations into your planning, uh, into your daily scrum? Uh, so things like that. So um, yeah, I, I would take a look at that scrum guide, uh, Kanban guide for scrum teams and, um, and look there for some clues, but it doesn't take a lot to start making a big difference in your scrum teams. And one of the things that I tell people, um, you know you'll benefit from flow inside your scrum, uh, inside your sprint, uh, sprints, if, if you have burn down charts, which aren't required for scrum, but if you have them and they look like cliffs, like they're just flat, 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 and then at the end, everything finishes all at once, you definitely could benefit from some flow practices. And the goal is to start getting work done faster and more often within your sprint so that you can start work throughout your sprint and not get everything, um, you know, one batch at the end. So whether or not you do continuously deliver, we want continuous flow throughout our sprints um, because even within the sprint, the sprint's not a release cadence. You have to have an increment at the end of each sprint that is usable or valuable um, and releasable, sorry, potentially releasable is the right way. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can't have that more often. It's at the very end, you at least have to have a potentially releasable uh, increment. Um, but if you can do things faster and more often throughout your sprint, then you can get the feedback loops even smaller and help you um, even learn within your sprint about the things that um, the things that you had planned and do they even need to change them. So adding flow can essentially shrink your feedback loops even less than the sprint length itself. Um, so I think it's a very complementary practice. Hopefully that helped a little bit. I feel like I'm just like doling out wisdom to the void. So if you have any, if you want to talk about any of these, uh, please, we, we can definitely do that. I don't know if anyone else for specifically has any more things about that or if you feel like I covered it enough for someone to get started. Just a follow up question on that one. Yeah. Would you say uh, establishing the workflow would be an absolutely necessary thing to do before going any more further? I think that everything that you're doing uh, to improve flow hinges on an understanding of your workflow at a basic level. It's hard to improve flow if you don't take a, a step to try to understand what that is. That said, a lot of people assume that you have to have a super granular workflow with everything sort of in minute columns so that you can track every little step. You can have a workflow that's to do doing done and still improve your flow with flow practices through that three step workflow. Right. Um, you only need to complicate your workflow if there's stuff you can't see to improve. So if you have things starting to get stuck in doing, you need to investigate more about that doing. And so then you might dive in more and see, well, what happens in doing? What are, are there different activities that routinely happen so that I can separate those out and start to get a little more data about those? But the interesting thing that we don't talk about a lot is that adding more columns to your board can have a negative effect. So there's a nice balance in between because the more columns you have, the more places you have to stash work. So having thousands of columns means you've got a lot of work going on or a bunch of empty columns and we don't like empty columns, right? <laughs> so um, there is definitely a balance of the right amount to visualize too granular is a hassle, people hate it. And you know, it's maybe making it too hard and not providing the information that you need. 
And then not having enough granularity maybe isn't giving you the visibility you need to see the real problems and, and where you're having the issues. So it's a bit of a design challenge. And I always tell people to start simple and then complicate it because it's really hard to back out of complication, make it too complicated with lots of columns and then start removing them is a bit more difficult because you've already turned people off. So, you know, if you aren't sure, go with simple and then tell people just like everything else, this is an iterative process. Even if you put a lot of time into it, you'd never get your workflow 100% right at the very first time. A Kanban board or any visualization is like a work in progress. So expect to change it. Don't think it's a failure because you had to change it. If you don't change it, I'd assume you're not really learning much about your process along the way because it's a tool to help you improve, you know? And as you find problems, you might need to adjust that visualization to give you different information, right? And you fix this problem and now you have a new one because that's usually the reward for fixing one problem is finding the next one. Um, so then you might need different information to really hone in on that problem. So it's a tool to be used, not something to get perfect and let sit, if that makes sense. Cool. As you were talking about, uh, I remember a few years ago, one UK government department, they, they did a lot of Kanban work and they ended up with a board which was like 50 columns and 20 swimming lanes. Yeah. And the problem they had then is that it, it was taking an enormous amount of time to try to manage that board. So yeah. had actually, they actually went to the point that they have lost the ability to manage flow on this. It was just too much on it, too detailed. And and that's with anything, like you can take it way overboard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, and even people who have been doing this a long time have problems. I've got a Kanban board right now with my product team that isn't perfect. We need to figure out a good way to, you know, uh, improve it. And I've helped hundreds of teams with their Kanban boards before, but every team needs a slightly different board based on their concept context. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, next, I was say, yeah. Julie, next question, we have one from, from Harun, but actually, Harun, you had like three questions in there. Would you, would you like to ask a question? I know you had your hands up before. Harun? Portfolio. Cam Hi there. About por portfolio. Visualize portfolio, Kamran. Hi there, Jose. Yeah, thank yeah. you for that. Sorry, I just thought I thought I was trying to get all the questions in one, but yeah, you're right. Maybe <laughs> I should ask one question. The question I've got is uh, I'm in a situation where an organization has welcomed and embraced uh, a portfolio Kanban approach for work, but they're so fixated on this front door process thing, meaning how do how does it all get prioritized and, and put in there? What steps or, uh, or things would you do or say to influence these very senior leaders and stakeholders who've done the same thing uh, for many, many years and it hasn't worked? How would you best visualize that um, situation with them? And what two or three like big nugget steps would you take That's a good question. And I'm remembering a, a speaker coach guide telling me to not compose while I speak. So I'm going to think about it for a second. <clears throat> I think that um, a lot of times the processes that we choose cause a lot of management overhead. And by having, I don't want to say that prioritization is never needed or isn't very important, but there are other things that we could do to make it less necessary. And so we always look at, oh, we have to get the right, for instance, prioritization policy done. And that's the most important thing. And we can't move forward until we get this right prioritization thing done. But if we did other things alongside figuring out our prioritization, like uh, working on smaller items so that I have more opportunities to prioritize and things don't take quite as long. So then, you know, I know that I'm gonna get to start another thing sooner. And so now the priority is just that tiny bit less critical because I'm starting to do things faster and we don't have to wait forever to get to the new thing, which means it has to be in the exact perfect order because we have to, you know, wait forever. There's, it's a system. So there are lots of things that sort of interplay here. And I would say that fine, think about your 
prioritization, um, but also think about what are the other things that would make them work, worry about priority less. If we had these conditions, I would be less stressed about priority and try to incorporate some of these other things alongside trying to figure out an ideal way to prioritize. But going to, I think this next thing has less to do with Kanban than just figuring out how people, right? How do I get them to do something different than they've always done and they've never gotten the results they've wanted? Um, you know, there's, there's this, um, it makes me think of that book, Art of Action by Stephen Mungay, where, um, you know, there's all these knowledge gaps and it helps us understand that we can't know everything that we need to know to plan our way to perfection. And we, we start to realize that, but yet the very thing we do is to double down on all of like, try to do even better planning and try to do even better instructions and, and all of that. And it's sort of like this vicious circle. So I would just try to help point out that sort of inconsistency that, you know, where you need to go so far that hasn't taken you there. Why do you think taking another pass at it will get you there this time? and make it a conversation instead of a, like yelling at someone. Um, I, I don't have a perfect answer to that. Maybe if we have time, that can be something that we can discuss as a team. But um, I think the biggest advice would be to figure out reasons to make priority less important and start chipping away at some of that because the more time you spend on prioritization, you know, I, I consider that a little bit of failure demand, things that we have to do because something else isn't done right. Yeah. Thank you, Julia. That's really helpful. Really, really helpful. Thank you. Good, because I didn't know <laughs> that was not. <laughs> Julia, let's, I'm going to come by a couple of questions that are here. One yeah. from Simon Mayer and, and Don from McClellan. Yeah. Um, whip limits. Let's talk about whip limits. Yeah. Um, let's talk about whip limits. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Personal whip limits versus um, column whip limits versus, you know, um, uh, board level whip limits. What's your view on them about different ways of whip, limiting whip or limiting whip in general? Yeah, um, so I'm familiar with a portion of the ways that you can limit whip and I'm less familiar with some other ways um, that can be done. So when I have taught Kanban classes in the past, which is traditional type of, you know, Kanban classes, I've taught that there's multiple ways to limit work in process or work in progress. I don't even say that consistently. Um, so I had always taught it that, you know, any way that sort of, that there, I'll step back, there are different ways. So you can limit, you know, a Kanban, a width limit for your whole board. Like, let's just not have more than 20 things on our board at one time, right? That sort of, for me, is a stop the bleeding approach. It's a first level triage to stop, you know, to make sure that we stop, focus and get ourselves in a space where we can even think about beginning to improve. Um, there are other ways, as you pointed out, um, you know, a per person with limit, um, a per column with limit, all of these things. I had always thought that I'm very willing to be challenged that the others, like the board based and the per person based didn't necessarily take us all the way to really understanding and managing flow through the system. They, they, they are great. And I encourage people to start with those, especially because sometimes getting to a column based whip is difficult and you don't know how to start. And I think it can be scary. And so people don't do it. So the, I'm, I encourage all kinds of ways to limit work in process. But um, I had always taught before that the ultimate goal might be to get to that more flow managing work throughout your process and so more towards a column based. I'm not entirely sure that is 100% correct. So I'd love to hear Jose maybe what you say about that. But also I wanna rec recognize that um, that Steve Tendon and Daniel Dorong and people in the Tameflow community might approach with an entirely different approach, like a drum buffer rope kind of thing. And even Scrum 
limits work in process by way of, you know, saying this stuff is in our sprint backlog and for the next couple of weeks or whatever, we're going to work on that. So there's thousands of ways and the only bad way is not to start at all. <laughs> but Jose, what do you say? Oof, my take on this is, um, so starting with an assumption is normally when, when you start working with people, with teams, one assumption is that people will have probably too much work. So, so trying to make people's lives better, more sustainable, more healthy and balanced, that, that's a good start, yeah? And how you might get to do that, you might go in different ways. Um, personal weight limits sometimes is just a very, very straightforward way of doing, say, look, you know, I can see that you got like 20 things in progress. That's going to kill you if you keep going like this. Let's limit that a little bit. However, that's not, that's not really flow management. That's probably more like, Re, uh, resource management. I hate the word resources in this context, but that's probably more resource management. Um, as Julia was saying, like getting getting to to board level whips is fairly common. It's a way of saying like you know we probably still have too much work. Let's let's keep it down. I I think that I think that column whip limits are are doable, but as you say, they are quite complex and and usually sometimes work is too it's quite variable, so it's quite it might be difficult to get to a good column base with limit. So I, I'm starting to see in the community quite a lot more people being vocal about saying probably it might be that um, board level with limits, if they're good enough for you, that might be as good as you, you that might be good. To, don't, don't, don't need to go further. But there is other, other sides of it. You, you, the, the fact that, and this is something that has been challenging from the Pro Kanban perspective in the same Pro Kanban doesn't even advocate that we must have with limits. But with, what, what Pro Kanban is trying, the guide, the, the Kanban guide that is there is saying, what we need to be able is to manage work, man, actively manage the flow of work and manage work. Um, it says controlling whip. It's controlling whip, yeah. So, and, and to do that, typically whip limits work, but it's not necessarily the way to do it. And, oh, you know, yeah. we can it start can talking about- that form. Yeah, I can take that form, but it's not necessarily the, 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 the it's not it's not required and it's not universally required that there must be a whip limit. I, I've seen teams that they are they're getting towards controlling whip and controlling the workloads purely by saying, hey, we, we need to do less. Um oh, and then we can start talking about aging, which is you know another way that is helping a lot of teams do a lot of really interesting things. This you is okay. about aging. <laughs> can I hop in real quick and just yeah. add a tidbit? Because this was the thing that I would probably want to start with. And I've been doing Kanban for a decade, right? Um, but I think maybe only in the last year, year and a half, did I really start to understand the importance of paying attention to work item age, almost to the point where I think it's more important than worrying about whip limits. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen really quickly. Um, Yes, this one. Okay. So if I, for instance, have a Kanban board and I've got a whip of four here. So I'm staying in, in this lane, you know, I, I'm staying in my whip limit and I can keep this, I can keep compliance by continuing to leave a lot of stuff in my, uh, in my board, in my column here and let it age and age and age. But still never break my whip limit and never show that anything is wrong. But yet these three items are sitting here aging and aging and aging, making my um, cycle times and my expectations um, very unpredictable for my stakeholders. So not only do we want to care, I'm gonna stop sharing now. Um, not only do we want to care about you know, limiting whip, the, the amount of work you have in process is, is part of a leading indicator to how long things will take in the end. But um, if you're familiar with Little's Law and stable systems, it's not enough to just, you know, keep the amount of items in your system approximately the same all the time, like start at the same rate you finish. The other part of that is making sure things don't age unnecessarily. And if you're caring about work item aging, 
um, it's going to drive you to practices like should I, if I don't want my items to age, should I start thinking about controlling how many I start? And should I start doing things that are smaller? And should I start doing all of these other things? So paying attention to work item age is one of the things that we don't do a lot, but can be potentially one of the most powerful practices that you can do. Because if I'm caring about how old my items are as I'm working on them, and I realize that when I put this into the finish column, you know, on the very end, it then becomes part of my historical data. And I'm using my historical data to do all these things like um, make commitments to people uh, via service level expectations or forecasts when we might get things done. Um, you know, my ability to give good forecasts and to have answers people like depends heavily on how I manage my work when it's actively in progress and how old they are could maybe have even more, pack, more impact than how many you have in progress at one time. So I feel like I did that very badly, much better in my head than out of my mouth, but um, that's something I wanna throw out there as my tip for tonight, my unsolicited tip for tonight, is care about whip aging as much or more than you care about work in process limits. And add to that as well is like, in, in terms of like how we communicate with it between human beings, yeah. Um, the who 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 finds the conversation about whip limits and reducing whip and things like that an easy conversation in business? Something that people go and say, yeah, I'll get it. Who gets it? Oh, well, it's one of the difficult conversations, and it's very difficult to convince people about limiting whip. I don't like even the word limiting. I prefer to talk about balancing whip. And that's a little bit easier to say, like, you know, you're trying to balance the, the amount of work that you can reasonably do. Yeah. But even that, it's almost counterintuitive that you need to you need to to probably manage the amount of work. One of those less is more. Yeah. However, the aging conversation is actually something that we, we that resonates much more with people. Do you really want your 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 work items to age? Do you want to let them they are languishing? And becoming old and aging or do you want to deliver them and it's much easier to people to start see that conversation i find that much more a an easier powerful conversation within with teams with management in the organization to say well you know if you're going to start it now if you're going to start a new piece of work will it be will you be able to do it quickly or will it just start aging and not not get any value to start getting the cobwebs Oh, yeah, yeah, it's going to age. Okay, well, then maybe we don't start it. Reserve that option, that decision for later on when, when you might have a better chance of finishing it. So it, I, find, I find aging a, a, a more, a, an easier conversation within business to, that resonates with people as well. So it's not only a very powerful metric, it's also a very powerful conversation. Yeah. Cool. Did you want to take the next question from Steve about... Um, Pro Kanban, do we have a, a succinct answer? Um, let's do that. I mean, uh, okay, um, Steve was asking a question about, um, you want me to take it or you want to take it? <laughs> we, you can start, okay. we can take it together. <laughs> um, so what's the relationship between Pro Kanban and, and David Anderson, Kanban University, um, whatever? Uh, does Pro Kanban teach Kanban differently? Um, um, I was not intending to show this, but I'm, I'm actually, I'm, I'm in the middle of a Pro Kanban class. So um, the Kanban guide that we're using in Pro Kanban is eight pages, eight pages long. Okay, so um, eight pages long, and I think that includes like introduction and credits and acknowledgements and things like that. So um, what we are trying to, what we're trying to teach, the Kanban that Pro Kanban is trying to teach at the moment is a very, essential aspects of what, what makes Kanban Kanban and what makes flow, okay? And a very, hopefully very actionable way of getting Kanban started. So you wanna, if you think about that as the kind of like the core of the, 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 the gemstone of Kanban captured there, um, then there are lots of really good and interesting things about that which from the pro Kanban perspective are complementary practices. There are other things that you could be adding if it's useful and, and you choose to do them in different environments. But if you want to just get to that like piece of like, what is the nugget, the, the gemstone of, of Kanban, 
Pokemon says this just those eight pages, then you can add hundreds of more pages if you wanted to. So yeah. the relationship in that way is like one, one is like kind of like very much to, to me now. I mean, I, and I've been teaching Kanban method for many, many years as well. Yeah. It's That's like, how I okay, learned. Yeah. Pokemon <laughs> is just the, the Pokemon is just kind of like the essence of it. And then there is a lot more out there that can be very useful. I mean, you can do Kanban method, you could do um, pain flow, stiff tendons, you can do flight levels talk about portfolio Kanban and connecting to strategy. You can do a lot of other things that are also in the realm of flow management, Kanban and so on, yeah? yeah. So I think mm. that, Jose, I think uh, someone said it quite well mm. that mm. if there wasn't already market share with the word Kanban and that's where people would be looking for the content we have, we mm. might've actually just called it flow management. Yes. Yes. Because we're taking it just back to what are the minimal pieces that you have to think about to manage flow, like Jose said. And then there are many other things that you might decide to do. They're complementary practices that you use based on your, your context. And there are, um, it, it's, not it's not necessarily recommended to be a change management methodology or things like that. And there's a lot in, um, the Kanban method that is coming from a certain perspective, um, starting where you are, which sometimes is the right thing to do and sometimes isn't. Sometimes you need, need to make a change up front or, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that might be contextual. So we're looking to take it back to a very basics and then help people figure out what complementary practices to add. And it's, it's a bit like how the Scrum Guide tries to be a minimal frame of what Scrum is. Uh, and if you've looked at the revisions over the years because they published the change logs, uh, very rarely have they added stuff. It's more been removing, removing, removing to get it back to its simplicity. They realize they overprescribed based on specific contexts. And um, yeah, so that makes it harder for people exactly what to do in every situation, <laughs> but it, uh, it it's a minimalist approach and gives another opportunity for uh, a community and certifying body as well. Mm -hmm. cool. um, but Hopefully yeah, that's, that's good everything enough. is good. Yeah, yeah, everything that teaches you about better flow is good. <laughs> yeah. All right, okay. there's a question here. I'm gonna summarize it a little bit from, from yep. Andra. And he's like, I, I think I just can catch you by saying, like, how can you encourage a scrum loving team to use management method, over which you just said is not a management method, to, to use Kanban? Yeah. And see, station metrics. So I think what we've been trying to do for a long time in the Kanban community is tell people that it's not an either or situation. Scrum and Kanban do completely different things. There's some overlap in that they both try to limit WIP in certain ways and whatnot. Although now we just talked about how, you know, you might not even need a WIP limit to limit WIP, that kind of thing. Um, so Kanban is all about improving flow, right? Through your process and helping even decrease the feedback loops even smaller, even sub sprint, right? Um, it has nothing to do about emergingly figuring out what you need to be doing to achieve a customer goal or achieve a goal, which is what Scrum is all about. It's taking, I need to do these things and we don't know how to get them done. So let's figure out a way to iterate on things to get to the end goal, which may be different than where we were when we, where we thought we'd be when we started. Those two things are not the same at all. Right, so why would we choose one or the other when both can fit together quite well? Regardless of how you come to Kanban or flow practices, you've always been able to layer them over any process that you use, right? That's something that is said in the Kanban method. It's something that we say, you know, when you're just thinking about minimal flow. So why couldn't, if you can do that with any process, why can't you lay it over a scrum process? Why is that a problem? Right. I mean, most of the time people think, oh, I stopped my sprint, so I'm stopping flow. Well, so what? You're improving. <laughs> You're improving your flow within the sprint. And more and more, Scrum says that the sprint is not a release cadence anymore. You know, it it doesn't have to be the only time you deploy, right? So you can continuously deliver with inside a sprint. So why can't you continuously worry about your flow inside of sprints and across sprints and 
through sprints. Um, so I don't think it's an either or. I think that's a thing that we have to get people away from seeing that as that way. And um, if, you, if you approach people and they see it as an either or and you get that, then help them understand why they're complementary practices. Because that's what Scrum looks to Kanban as, a complementary practice. That's how we teach it. This is complementary to Scrum. And you can apply that without changing any aspects of the Scrum framework. So that's what I would say. Um, I'm gonna, I, I know there is quite a few questions, so I'm mindful about the time. So I might have to jump um, one yeah. or two because there's a, there was one that is complementary, what, what, which is the opposite in some ways. Uh, ben was asking, what, what happens if you, if your work cannot be done inside a sprint? It's too big for a sprint. Would you, what, what would you choose in between Scrum, Kanban? What, what, what thoughts about that? Must you favor is, Kanban is, is that a, over Scrum? Is, is that a good uh, reflection of your question, Ben? You're muted. But I think yeah, okay. he said, yeah. He, he's nodding. <laughs> yeah, I mean, again, I don't think it's an either or thing. You care about flow or you don't. If you care about flow, then these things can help you manage it, improve it, right? Whether you're using Scrum or not. Um, I think that in the way that um, Kanban can sort of serve as a perfection challenge to continually improve your flow, you might have a challenge that you know you'll never reach, but you continue to strive for it so that you'll always improve. Perhaps that's how you can look at that sort of situation from a Scrum perspective. I may not ever fit my work neatly into these sprint cadences. And you know it doesn't have to be two weeks, but some people's timelines are dramatically different. So what are the things that I need to, I need to continually challenge myself with to improve, um, even if I can never get all the way there? How can I make my work smaller? Because that's almost always a good practice, right? Um, and even if I never get it to fit in within a four month sprint, or a one month sprint, trying to do that might get us some improvement, you know? So I don't know, I don't have a perfect answer, but that's where my head is on that right now. If that makes sense. I was going to ask if you've got any suggestions on how you can get people to recognize the benefits of improving flow on those big batch, batches of work. Because in, in Scrum, every two weeks, you can have a demo, you can crack open the champagne, you've achieved something, something valuable. Mm -hmm. But if you've got something that takes months to deliver, then it's harder for the team to sort of really buy into the fact that you need to watch your aging work and have lots of columns, that sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, I would probably, I try to remember that it's not my job to try to convert people to a different methodology of religion. I'd much better serve the people um, that I'm trying to help by figuring out what problems they have and trying to see if managing flow would help them solve any problems and approach it from that perspective. So for instance, well, what would it feel like if it took you four months to find out that you went in the wrong direction. You know, what might we be able to do if we can't get all the way down to one month sprints, right? Which is sort of the outlying bound that Scrum says. You know, what are some things we could do to at least know we're on the right path along the way and maybe have cadences around, you know, what are some indicators and things like that? and um, you know, keeping the flow smooth enough so that you can get as early feedback as possible. You know, I just try to keep pushing to faster feedback loops, whether it's through Scrum or Kanban or anything or both together. Thank you. you know? mm -hmm. We've got two questions which are like, sort of like around the topic of roles that I have found. So um, first of one was, um, okay, Kanban roles. And then we know the Kanban method, that has two roles, yeah. Um, how, how do you, how do you, how are these roles practiced in the real world? Are you? 
So are we uh, talking uh, like uh, service manager and stuff like that? Because I haven't necessarily yeah, yeah. kept up in a while. <laughs> <laughs> so I have, I, have a, I have a story about this, okay? I mean, if, yeah. I think, um, let, let's just double check. Um, Anurag, I don't know whether you can be on audio. Um, are you asking about the sort of like service delivery yes. manager and the service request manager? Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. All right, so I'll tell you a story about this because I mean, basically what, what these are not, these are not formal roles and, and in, in Pro Kanban, there is no roles whatsoever. So basically it's, effectively is like what what do you have in your organization what helps you to to deliver work successfully so there is no pre-formatted predetermined roles okay but where the and, and and the common method didn't used to have roles either okay what emerged over time was that and, and this shouldn't be jobs that you have job titles yeah but when you have people working in a government system there are kind of like two things that should be happening as well as possible and improving. One is the, the idea about, are we actively being able to manage flow? And are we improving our Kanban system? That, that, that's one question. The other one might be, all right, so we got all this, all this tsunami of potential, potential options that people want us to do, all this demand, all these requests to do work. What might be the best way of selecting those out of all those ones? How do we select the ones that may be the most impactful for the organization? All right. So one is about managing flow and improving flow. The other one is about, okay, what do we work on? Yeah. In the Kanban method, they gave it two names, service delivery manager, which is actually a terrible choice because it already exists in things like ITIL and the service request manager. They don't have to be a person doing that the team or the people working in the system might be able to do those roles through self-organization, however we do it, but, but it's not necessarily that you have to have someone now with the job title service request manager. What the, what the system needs is somehow a way of selecting work that is as effective or as appropriate as possible. That, that's how I see those roles. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Julia, any? Yeah, no, I mean, mm -hmm. I think that's similar to Scrum where you don't need to have a person that's title is a product owner or a Scrum master or whatever. It's Those are things that need to be accomplished but can be done, you know, with people doing other duties as well, maybe with a completely different title. So separating titles from things that need to happen um, it is good as well. And you could argue in a Scrum, for example, the role of a Scrum master. I, when I work in, in when I'm agile coach and stuff, I say, like, the more I am invisible, the more successful, hopefully, I am being. So in many times, those roles needs to be if they are if there's something that is they are happening within the number of the people working in that system. Awesome. If you need to start nominating people to force it, to remind people, to kind of like make it happen, then there is some other underlying situations that you could be argue, arguing that are not working. Is yeah. that right? And I, don't, I, and I just think that the two of them have the role manager. And you think, okay, is that, is, that, is that formalizing a dysfunction? Yeah, I, I did a talk back in Agile 2016 with, um, with someone, I, I hate to say it, like the tech and the business side. But um, my role was the tech manager at NBA.com at Turner Sports in Atlanta. And um, I was trying to help the team, the business implement Kanban. And so I, along with the, my business uh, side compatriot, we gave a talk together about how that sort of unfolded and um, covered things like, um, replenishment cadences and who I met with and um, helping them understand how, you know, if you only have one or two people left over after you put all these other people on projects and you've got this day-to-day -day work to do and stuff that how they had to really understand and accept whip limits that it was a hard pill for them to swallow. But once they saw the results, um, they realized that was probably a better way to go than any way they had tried before because they got to understand the true capacity of a person instead of pretending that one person could do seven things all at once. And so some different things like that. So that you asked for a case study, it's not really a case study, but uh, if you listen to bits, fast forward through bits and things like that, you might find some good tidbits there to help with that. 
Um, ben, oh, there was Harry. a yeah, well, just a question because there was a second question about roles from from Dylan. Oh, okay. Is Dylan still around? I was talking about teams. Teams are full of specialists. Yeah. I don't know if yeah, I'm still here. Yeah. Yeah. There you are. Go for it. Yeah. So again, when Dylan. I worked at, oh god, Dylan, I see your question. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, does the question make sense or do I need yeah. to clarify it? Yeah, yeah. No, I think it makes sense. So you have a specialist, a team full of specialists, a team full of almost individuals, right? Yeah. Um, although in your situation, do these specialists come together to create something common? Sorry, you broke up there. Did you ask a question, Julia? Yeah. Um, so a lot of times I'll see just a, a people that are sort of team and name only where they're just random people doing yeah. different things but someone grouped them as a team but in other situations you have a team full of people with different skills still trying working on things to come together to deliver a common result so which in your situation which is it there's one element of the work which is common but it's mm -hmm. kind of a mixture of both julia and mm -hmm. um, there's also an element where they're just doing stuff for other people it's like quite random it's not yeah, and and the way you described it is, it, it was literally unfortunately this team, you know, when they were restructuring, these were the people that were left over, and it didn't make sense to go in another <laughs> team, so they just put them in a team. That's only the yeah. leftover team. Yeah. Okay. They're the team of misfit toys. Okay. Yeah. Um, I bet they feel lovely about that too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm thinking there's going to be a lot of contextual real advice, but maybe some things to think about are um, you're, you're not going to be able to have a cross-skilled team of people with really deep skills, right? That's right. But I'm assuming that there are some people who would eventually like to take a day off and not get called if there's yes. an emergency or something, right? So that idea, I mean, have you heard of the concept of T-shaped people? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm already just telling you already stuff you already know, but for other people, it's people who have a basic level of knowledge across multiple domains or yes, you know yeah. skill levels, uh, but they have their own deep knowledge in their specialty. So um, if you really want to improve flow, you're going to have to give some thought to um, how to at least allow people outside of your single specialists to do the basic level work. If you think about specialists as you know, really premium time, like then, and, and you start realizing that if only one person can do this thing, uh, that means they, they're very expensive and yeah. I need to make sure that like ambulances, they're not always busy in case I need them for something really urgent. So their time is at a premium. And so the more people can learn the easiest things that those specialists right now have to do, the more time those specialists have for the things that are really challenging for them and the easier work will flow through your system because now you have fewer constraints on who can do it. But let's be serious. It's not going to always be super deep, yeah. you know, that you get that cross training. Um, one thing that we did at, in my MBA team was every quarter we built a board of cross training and we said, um, everyone had to be teaching something and everyone had to be learning something. And for that quarter, we said, okay, I'm the primary um, teacher of this concept. And we had a backup that could help out. Um, yeah. And then the learner, same thing. Here's what I'm primarily learning this quarter. Because uh, we even have flash people, like one flash person. And, you know, it was, it was crazy. So there's lots of things that, that we had to know to run this website. Um, and it was not an overnight thing, but it was something that was really crucial to improving flow. Because uh, if, if that's really important to you, that's something you're asked to think about. But um, that's probably not the only thing you need to address, right? Yeah. Um, I can't even uncover right now the things. That might be a good, a, a good thing all in of itself, Jose, is to have a topic on specialization and diving into this kind of team. Um, yeah. I mean, well, you know, Julia, okay. you, you're 100% correct. Um, I mean, my gut kind of led me to, you know, how do I, how do I encourage a bit of, you know, cross-skilling here? Because yeah. without that, I don't even know what better would look like because it's like yeah. coaching, I, it's coaching five individual people as opposed to coaching a team. So people can self-organize within constraints. 
right? Or self, yeah. you know, so it, there's a misconception sometimes that to be self-organized means no one can give you any constraints, but constraints help us function, mm. you know, so that we're not flailing around too wildly. So if you give people a constraint that you must be learning something and you must be mentoring on something and let them self-organize across the predefined list of things that you're single bottlenecked on about who wants to take on what. The thing is, is that when you do that, you actually need to give them time to do the teaching and do yeah. the learning because otherwise it's an unfunded mandate and that just pisses people off. Yeah. <laughs> no one can do it, but you're expecting it. Perfect. Um, Thank you. But, yeah. And that, can I add one thing about this thing? Because um, w one thing that I see many times in business, and I think uh, I might be reading too much into what you were saying, but just just in case, um, we we teams are awesome. Teams, if you can if you can have a team um, in your business, it makes sense. Yeah, but like we said with with limits, but teams are not necessarily the universally good answer all the time. Sometimes we create teams that makes that make literally no sense. Yeah, and you're not, you don't have a team, you have a collective of people there, yeah? yeah? Not working like a team, but then having all these, re these things that become rituals mm. about but are all built around collaboration and interdependence and working together. And they're like, I just do my thing, yeah? Yeah. So, so um, there, the sentence that is absolutely makes sense to say, look, you are the, you, if you have a situation that someone is an absolute single piece of like knowledge and skill in the company, um, treat it as a treat that person or that or that couple of people, whatever, as a service, and then make sure that you you are taking a lot of business risk there because again that person goes on holidays, probably are double Colin that Rich, there. yeah, something <laughs> happens, <laughs> they they get hired by someone else, then you are as a business you are in trouble. You're S O L. Yeah. So so that's one situation. Like you know, sometimes we we try to form teams when when it, that that actually doesn't make sense. Yeah, and it might be better to treat those people as services. The other yeah. thing about about this as well with the, with the T-shaped is like, all right, if you have people who are highly specialized and potentially in a team, they might not be on their own. They might not be able to, to do everything that is going to take a piece of request all the way to delivery to production or whatever it is. Yeah. Now, if if in the organization you have we have a mindset where people not having work it's not good. We have to keep people busy. And people can only do one thing. What's going to happen? We're going to scramble through our backlog looking for work for that person because otherwise they have nothing else to do. That's already happening. And, That's spot exactly. on. Spot on. Exactly. And you're and, starting and, work that won't add value for ages. And the consequences <laughs> is that you're creating, you're, you're starting work because someone was busy and you have no chance of finishing it because the other people that will eventually have to do the work, they're already maxed out. Yep. So you end up creating all these interrupts, all this workload. This is why we end up with organizations that we are choking with work. And many times because like what we are primary, what, what, what our primacy in decision making is keep our resources, resource thinking busy. And what needs to be busy is the work. So T-shaped people, for example, in this case, give us more options, give us the options to say, like, where can I help the workflow most today or to, you know, on the next few days? Uh, Jose, can I yeah. fly the flag at this point for yes. having lots of columns on the board to enable T-shaping? Because everybody's got a, a finite amount of time for training, mm -hmm. as Julia said, mm -hmm. or budding up with somebody. What, what is the most value-adding partnership you have across the board? So if you've just got doing and there's multiple activities, what makes most sense for somebody to cover? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'll step back now, but no, no, I think it's specialists and, and they kind of work in that way. So it's quite interesting. And it, it may be that for trans, trans, as a transient thing to generate things like get people to be upskill and all the stuff, you might you may have very specific columns or, or the typical team, like they, they are not doing, uh, we have a quality issue. So we want to improve our review process. Adding that column might be a good thing. What I will hope that team is keeps asking a question about like, okay, is that column th six months down the line, is it still a necessary column rather than it's been here because it has been here for the last six years and it doesn't need, it's not needed anymore. So as, as you add columns, you might also move columns. So yeah, if it helps you to create a little bit of cross-pollination of skills, why not? Why wouldn't you do that? Yeah. Um, 
so yeah i mean it, it's a good point yeah um mm -hmm. what was i going to do with this but yeah i mean one thing one thing to be careful then is one thing that i see many times theme is like each column represents a particular skill and people go and say okay my column is x I'm a front end, I am back end, I am this particular technology, and that's my call, and I don't move out of it. If that's happening, yeah, if what ends up happening is that all those columns are representing handovers and skills, stuff like that, and, and specialism, I will argue that that's no longer workflow, that's job flows. It's still is 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 resource thinking, and you're mapping the different resources, the, the the different skill sets. Yeah, I've seen that a lot, and, and that's okay. I mean, that might be where we are now. But for me, the, the key thing is that, that those columns should represent how do we get work from we have an idea to it's gone out of our system. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I it mean, is... and there is a million answers there how you how teams will do it and how they will address it. You. Hmm? Yeah. If you if you don't want to or don't want to, that's not what I mean. If you, if you mm. can't for any reason or, you know, whatever, the other thing, there are other things you have to think about, which are different sequencing of work. If you've played Twig, uh, which is an, a version of the, like a, a different alternative to Git Kanban, um, you know, and you're thinking about how can I, if this activity is busy and I need someone to do more in this specialty, let me find work that needs more of that and less of the other things so that the flow evens out and whatnot. So there's always other things that you can think about and do, but there's a downside if you didn't really need to do that one yet and you're only picking it because of this problem, you know, it's just understanding why you're doing what you're doing. And if you're not happy about why you're doing what you're doing, try to figure out if you can need not to do that anymore. <laughs> you know, so there are no bad choices. There's just choices that have this consequence or that consequence. Yeah, we need to yeah. be mindful about those. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I don't know whether there is a mindful that we we schedule about one hour. We are now yep. one and five minutes. We're over. So yeah. is there one final question here that would be useful? Um, uh, I just begin the one by Chris. What are the best? Oh, best approaches for Kanban metrics that help? Um, let's see, so I'm trying to- There's more to it, but yes. Um, okay. I have colleagues who like a heavy amount of metrics in their mm. scrum. And, uh, you know, I, I think, again, this is contextual. If um, I, there's very little data you need to collect the four key flow metrics that you'll find in the Kanban guide and the Kanban guide for Scrum teams, you know, on prokanban.org or scrum.org. Uh, you really need a start date and an end date for each card. And you get aging by having a start date, but not an end date and knowing what the current date is, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and knowing on which day things end, you can count throughput and things like that. So you really only need two pieces of information to deliver all of these metrics. Um, that said, do what you can. If those four things are too much, maybe start with whip aging and throughput or cycle time or something like that. Start where you can at least get people to buy into the concept and then add more. Um, I know that, you know, over worrying about what people can take can lead you to underestimating people and not doing enough soon enough. But if you are worried about that, no one's saying you must do all of these things the very first day. Hmm. Start with what you feel like you can absorb and go from there because I'd much rather you do some of it than none of it, right? And to figure out which ones you would start with by looking at what your problems are because metrics are just tools to improve your situation. If you don't know what your situation is and you don't know what your problems are, measuring things can sometimes cause more harm than good. But I do look at these four flow metrics. Uh, that's cycle time, whip, whip age, and uh, throughput as sort of the things that you do at, with the nurse when you walk into the doctor's office, right? They do them every time because they're just basic health indicators. But when you go see the doctor, you talk about your stuff and then they might say more metrics or tests are needed. Like those are your specialty based on your problems. So I do think these all can work for any team to help give you a general indicator of your health. But, you know, 
do what you can do and don't beat yourself up about it and just try to improve from the starting point that you choose to start with. And go from and there, have, it's a journey. Yeah. If I can add something to that with the metrics, I mean, uh, what, what Julia just said, in order to capture these metrics, you can only need only two data points per work, per, per ticket. When the, when the work item got started, and either what's the date today or when did it get yep. finished? Yep. That's all. So if someone, when people- You can do it say, by hand. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. So if someone says, when I hear people saying, but collecting all these metrics is a really difficult job, it's very onerous, it's a lot of effort. What I usually will say is like, is, are you telling me that you have too much work in progress? Is it, is it that really the problem is that we have just too many, too much work in progress, and then it becomes quite difficult and quite, quite a bit of time to actually go managing all these different work items, when they get started, when they get finished, when they get moved. If you're, if you're really having a good balance flow and, you're, and we're actually controlling the, 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 the amount of work we have, it, doesn't, it shouldn't really be too much effort to keep all those, to get those basic metrics going. So, so it's a bit of bit of like I, I kind of like probably is 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 answering left field, but but if, if really there is a lot, the, those metrics are very difficult to keep to be kept. I would argue that perhaps it's there is just too much work going on, too many things in flight, and maybe we'll be there. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe I've got something just useful to add in terms Simon, of, of course, metrics you. as well in terms of yeah. getting started with a team. Um, yeah. At least in my experience, what's worked best is the teams where they take an interest in the age of an item. So they just, uh, as a first thing, looking at the cycle time and um, we've used the actionable agile plugin and that, that's worked very well for us as well. Mm -hmm. But to oversimplify it, say you've got 10 items, you just look at the slowest one and as a team, they just go through and they say, well, what happened with this one? And they look at the history in JIRA, they put comments when weird things happen, they look when things were stuck in a certain status. Mm -hmm. And they just note it down and eventually they get a pattern and they see, oh, we keep saying that this thing happened and this thing happened again. And then they can start to take action around it. And over time they see the improvement. And then it, it's easy to start with, it gets a bit harder over time because you've already solved the easy things. But then you can start looking at more advanced stuff as well, like the aging, work in progress as well to take it to the next level. Yeah. Awesome. That's a great point. And I actually, I will, I will to, to complement what you're saying, what the, the most transformative change that I've seen in many times in teams is when they start looking, when we start bringing things like the, the concept of age and aging to things like daily scrums, daily standups, whatever you're using. When, when you want to see self-organization self in action, teams making decisions about how do we win today aging is 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 really really uh, to me i don't want i don't like to use the word transformative but i can see a huge change in how teams communicate talk make decisions um by by paying attention to aging which is going back to what julia said earlier on and what simon was saying now oh. cool um, I think we are we 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 have overrun our our yeah. time box. <laughs> we're flowing, so um, I would like to, to, to say yeah. <laughs> we're overflowing now. So I'd like to say um, thank you, thank you to all of you for being in this session. I hope you found it useful. Um, we will try to do something like this on more or less probably on a monthly basis, which means that on the 16th of December, exactly a month today. I'm going to have another session where I will be, I will have the privilege to have John Coleman joining us. John Coleman is another Kanban trainer and he's one of the co-authors of the Kanban guide. So if you've got questions about why between John and Daniel, Daniel Vacanti, that is, that why things are in the guide and not and what kind of decisions and stuff like that, hey, what a great chance to go and talk to him directly and do it. Um, uh, please uh, keep in touch with the community. If you are in the Lineage London, community, um, you might want to consider seeing about the Prokanban meetup group as well. And if you're in Prokanban meetup group, look at the Lineage and London meetup groups. Um, <laughs> but also um, join the, if you go to prokanban.org, you can you can look for the Prokanban web, uh, the Prokanban Slack channel and the community there, you know, any questions, any follow-ups, um, any thoughts, feedback, whatever. So 
Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Julia, for giving us your time. I know that in, in Sweden it's a little bit later. Is it what, eight, eight quarter past eight? Yeah, I did want to say that um, I just I put in the Slack uh, in the chat uh, my training page if anyone's interested in learning more or attending either a professional Scrum with Kanban class or an applying professional Kanban class. I'm one option for that. So please reach out um, on prokanban.org. You'll find other options. Mm -hmm. uh, mine are listed there too. So just so you know where to go. But thank you so much for coming. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Julia. And yeah, as what Julia was saying, yeah, if you if you want to learn about Prokanban, yeah, the website, Julia's website. Um, but yeah, thank you all of you. And we'll see you soon. See you about a month time. Oh, another thing, just in case, if you wanted to see the introduction to Kanban session, Prokanban session with Daniel Vacanti and Colin Johnson, and you couldn't make it last week, we're going to have a repeat on the 1st of December. It's going to go on the Prokanban uh, meetup group pretty much now um, we gave we gave the people that were in the waiting list a, a, a day or so extra notice so we will advertise a session again um, today tomorrow in the in the meetup group so thanks and we'll see you soon thank you that's the same sweden hey do hey do cheers bye adios adios <laughs>